Welcome back everyone. In this video we're going to start chapter two looking at lessons number one and two. And specifically we're going to look at line spectra and compare them to um, the continuous spectra that we observed in earlier videos. We're also going to look at um, what causes these line spectra and look at a specific example for hydrogen using what's called the Bohr model. So let's begin. We need to remind ourselves, we've already looked at this before, but how um, physics has changed our view of chemistry. Um, prior to the early 1900s, uh, Newtonian physics, what we sometimes call classical mechanics, dominated our understanding of the world around us. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks to work that was done by <coughs> early pioneers in quantum chemistry, we have a better understanding of the minuscule world, uh, the, the microscopic world. Um, studies were done that indicated that light behaved as a wave using diffraction. Studies were done that indicate light behaving as a particle. Um, we see that line spectra falls into that category, black body radiation and the photoelectric effect. And so we have this conflicting idea that light behaves both as a particle and as a wave. So now let's go a little bit more into depth about line spectra. So there's different types of light sources and they'll produce different types of spectra. So a light bulb is an example of a black body. It radiates generally a continuous spectrum um, and it gives us all frequencies of light, all types of light, although at different um, intensities. If you take a sample like mercury vapor lamp, this is going to give a uh, Mo a, a discrete or a line spectrum. So it maybe only gives off a few different colors. And you might see in some cases that they have bands in them as well, where they're, you've got um, a grouping of, of, of colors that, that kind of go along together. So it's somewhere in between a, a perfectly discrete um, spectrum where you have only individual lines and a continuous spectrum. And then you have uh, lasers, which generally produce monochromatic light, uh, light that's only of one specific frequency. And so in order to obtain these, uh, these different types of spectra, you essentially are looking at the chemical structure with uh, something like a light bulb where you have solid, solid matter, then because of the closeness of the atoms within the solid matter, you end up with getting, getting a lot of different types of uh, um, excitations and emissions. Whereas you, if you get something like a laser, that's generally made out of um, a single element in the gas phase. And so you're able to get very specific uh, wavelengths due to the specific transitions that it undergoes. And each element has its own unique line spectrum. So <clears throat> when you take a look at hydrogen in a discharge tube, it appears kind of this pinkish violet color. However, we talked earlier about spectroscopy and how a spectroscope takes that light sample and it uses a diffraction grating or it uses a prism to split it up into its components. So if you take this light and you split it up into its components, you get um, in the visible region four unique lines. And the sum of which gets us our overall color that's visible to the naked eye. So in a spectroscope, we can see that it's broken down into its individual um, lines. And notice that each element has a different spectrum. And what causes those spectra is due to the number of protons, the number of electrons, those energy levels that are associated with those individual transitions. And the fact that we have discrete lines, um, that we can only get these specific energy levels means that those energy levels are quantized. So in other words, we can only get a very specific electronic transition for each of these different elements. And that leads us to getting those same uh, colors of light. So for example, if you have an absorption where we're going up an energy, le up an energy level versus an emission, uh, in this diagram, we see that we have uh, two types of uh, absorption that are shown. Really, we could have a third one here. And so that would produce three different colors of light um, or, or require three different colors of light to make that occur. Whereas in the emission process, it's giving off that light. And so that would produce three different colors. 
where we have a low, a medium, and a high energy uh, transmission. And so the, when you look at the various spectra that we see, this is because you've taken your gas sample, you've maybe heated it up or put electricity through it, so it goes from a low energy level, oops, goes from a low energy level to a high energy level, and then it goes back down and emits off that light, and that's what we observe in terms of those frequencies. So let's talk more about why they have their own unique line spectra. And the simplest case is the hydrogen atom. That's because within the hydrogen atom, you have one proton and one electron. And that's it. No neutrons. So we can look at the interaction of these charged particles without the interference of uh, any other particles, any other positive or negative charges. So uh, when studies have been done regarding the hydrogen atom, they have observed the following that A, the energy levels that exist between, uh, within the hydrogen atom are, are different from each other. Not only are they different, but that they vary by, by a factor of, uh, to, to the second power. So they, they, are, they vary by, based on the energy level squared. What this means is that the energy difference between the first and the second energy levels is equal to 75% of the electronic transition, of, of let's say the maximum electronic transition. Whereas all of the rest of them, and you'll notice this is not to scale, this makes up the remaining 25% of the energy transition. So if we go from the ground state, n equals 1, to n equals infinity, where it has been ionized, 75% of the total energy required to make that process happen occurs in the transition from the first to the second energy level. And so the fact that these are all of different energy levels from one transition to the next means that we have different energies, different colors or wavelengths of light that are required to make those transitions occur and therefore we get out different energies when they um, go from high to low. So again, um, this n value is what we call the principal quantum number, and it can range from uh, 1 in the ground state to infinity. And that's what we call um, when the electron or electrons have been ionized. And so Niels Bohr proposed what we, uh, what we now call the Bohr model, and this is what is commonly depicted as um, the electron circling around, orbiting around the nucleus. Now, it turns out that that's not exactly true, uh, but it does work to quantify the energy of the electrons for the hydrogen atom. Uh, some things to note is that there's only certain radii that are allowed, only certain distances from the nucleus are allowed. And those uh, we, we describe using the principal quantum number, n, And uh, those go from 1 to infinity. And as we mentioned already, you can uh, excite the electron from a low energy state to a high energy state and go from high to low as well. Um, to, in order to excite that electron, you need to put in energy. So energy is absorbed. And when the uh, energy is given off or emitted, it goes back down to a low energy state. The Bohr model only works for elements with one electron. So that would be hydrogen or a helium positive charge or a lithium with two positive charges. So you have to, you, we only are talking about elements with one electron um, or ions with one electron. And so that's not very many, but it does accurately describe it. And it provided a good foundation for understanding the energy of more complicated elements. Let's dig a little bit deeper here in terms of the hydrogen atom. Um, we've seen something like this before. If you think back to when we talked about Coulomb's law, we described how the energy of interaction of two charged particles 
varies as the product of their charges over the distance. Well, we see a similar thing here with the hydrogen atom. And um, the, 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 the fact of our negative sign here comes from the fact that we have one proton and one electron. So the product of that is always going to be negative. So the energy of our electrons are always negative. Okay? Um, and then it does vary as a function of uh, the inverse of the distance. Now, in this case, it's not just distance, but it's actually the distance squared, or n squared. Um, one way to, there, there's two things to point out here. One, this is the way that it is, because this, these are what the data have shown. But two, if you think about it, if we were to uh, vary the, if the energy levels only varied by n and not n squared, then the distance between n equals 1 and n equals 2 would be the same as from 2 to 3 and 3 to 4, etc. And so these transitions would all be equal to each other. If that were the case, we actually would, would um, we wouldn't get the transitions that we actually observe for the hydrogen atom. So the data that we saw when looking at the uh, spectrum where we had the, the, the four different lines here is indicative of the electronic transitions that are occurring within the hydrogen atom. And those are accurately described where n varies, where n squared uh, dictates the distance. So when you put an electron, you bring it closer to the nucleus, that's going to end up being lower in electronic potential energy, similar to with Coulomb's law. Um, and that releases energy. Whereas in order to go uh, pull the electron away, you're putting energy in because they're attracted to each other. And so that requires energy to make that happen. So let's take a look at this in a qualitative sense. We want to know which of the electron transitions of a hydrogen atom will result in a light emission with the longest wavelength. So, uh, if we're talking about emission, uh, we know that we need to be going from uh, high energy, or high energy state, to low energy states. Okay? So when you look at these transitions, anything that's going from, uh, from low energy to high energy is an absorption. Okay, so A, C are absorptions. If we plot the other three, then we can see that those are as emissions. And if you, one way to do this is to draw the hydrogen energy diagram roughly to scale. When you do so, the length of the arrows is indicative of the total amount of energy involved in that transition. Okay, And so what we notice is that the largest emission arrow is that going from 2 to 1. Even though um, that, uh, that the number of transitions it undergoes is the smallest. Remember, this transition here is 75% see if this will work, is 75% of the total amount of energy uh, that could be exchanged. And therefore, it's going to involve the largest transition. So it's not just, we're not just looking at which one uh, goes the largest number of transitions, but rather, what is the uh, magnitude of energy required to undergo any given transition. And so what we see here is, um, if we're looking for, we want the longest wavelength, uh, this is going to be our highest energy. So that's going to be the shortest wavelength. Um, if we want the longest wavelength, we're looking for the shortest red arrow, which in this case then is going to be B. And you'll notice um, we're, we have an emission we're going from high to low energy, and um, generally speaking, it's involving uh, an ending value that's greater than one. If we end at a level of one, then that's going to involve this large energy transition. Okay, 
So we can not only qualitatively evaluate um, these, these line spectra, but we can also quantitatively uh, determine this as well. So um, what we see is that when you do any one of those transitions, let's say that we go from 4 to 2, that we, uh, we could have calculated the energy by looking at negative r, y over n squared. And that's the energy at any given n value. However, we're not typically concerned with what's the energy at a level, but rather what energy was emitted or what energy was absorbed. And so we need to look at the change in energy. And that's going to be equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of light. Because in this, uh, in this case, it's emitting light, and that light that's emitted has a specific frequency. And so the energy is going to be proportional to that frequency. So the change in energy then is looking at the energy of our final state minus the energy of our initial state. This is what we call the Rydberg equation. And this is on your data sheet. And it turns out that the Rydberg equation predicts the hydrogen atom spectrum exactly. And so we can use it then to describe what energy is required to uh, go from a, one, a lower energy to a higher energy, or what energy is given off when we go from high to low. So the last thing we're going to talk about here is I want you to practice this now. Um, I've shown you how to do one in a qualitative manner. Why don't you try this one on your own and see if you can quantitatively use Rydberg's equation to solve this problem. So pause the video and come back. Welcome back. Let's work through the solution on this. So we have hydrogen gas, and it's absorbing light equal to 91 nanometers. Assuming it was ionized, what was the initial orbit, or the initial energy level of the electron? So um, by using the Rydberg equation, we can solve for the, uh, the initial and the final states. We know that the energy of the the energy change of our transition states is going to be equal to the energy of the light that was, in this case, absorbed. Since we're given the wavelength, we need to use the relationship between wavelength and frequency to solve for, um, to solve for frequency and then uh, plug that in so that way we can uh, use the wavelength that's given. So one way here is to rearrange this equation and, and plug this in this way. Or we could have simply converted our wavelength to, um, to frequency and then solve for it that way. Our constants here are given, and those you can find on the data sheet. So we would need to convert our wavelength into meters. We can plug in our values. We have Planck's constant, the speed of light, and our wavelength here. That's equal to, the, to uh, the Rydberg constant times 1 over n initial squared minus 1 over n final squared. And you'll notice here I've put in a value of infinity for our n final. Remember that ionization is what happens when you take the electron and you separate as far as possible from the nucleus. And so we've defined that as an n state of infinity. So if you were to try and put this in your calculator, it wouldn't work you need to recognize that 1 over infinity is essentially equal to 0. Uh, the denominator is so large that 1 over that number is as close to 0 as we could possibly get. So in order to solve then, we can uh, rearrange this equation and solve for our initial state. And that would be n equals 1 or the ground state. Okay, thanks for watching. If you have questions, you can ask on Piazza in office hours or during our help sessions. Have a great day.